first photo that I've got that I could show you was a photo of my mom standing in front of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So I know that because she's in the photo and I'm not, so I, I know that that's, that's the first photo I can lay my hands on. So that would be the late 60s. Um, during university, I bumped into a couple of friends and they were into photography and they were going to school for photography. And that really influenced me because I guess I bought in at that point, like so many people did, to the idea of the photographer in the movie Blow Up because it was very exciting and there was all sorts of things going on and it was very sexy and you know he was making good money and making interesting images and you know meeting cute girls so the first photos I took were you know fashion shows rock concerts that sort of thing because you know I've always loved music and I've always loved girls <laughs> I came out of school and I started looking around for assisting work in Toronto. I ended up working for a fashion photographer. And it was a lot of fun. You know, we had a lot of fun shoots. We went on locations to Mexico and to Las Vegas and California. And I worked with them for three years and then I started my own studio. In the beginning, I really needed to just make money. So I shot weddings and I shot portraits and I shot a, a lot of product like anything that anyone would pay me to do, I would shoot. And uh, I, would, I would try and uh, do fashion as well, but uh, the whole concept of being a fashion photographer, you know, from the very beginning seemed sort of ridiculous to me, because, uh, you know, I'm just a kid from Oshawa, a bit of a nerd at that. Like the idea of being a Toronto fashion photographer just seemed sort of a ridiculous concept. Who are we shooting today? We're shooting Brendan Canning, who's the co-founder of Broken Social Scene. And we've got a bunch of ideas up in the air, but we'll just have to see how it works out. I went to university and I took anthropology and I'm very interested in people, still am, in a pop sort of way. I think that that, that informed me in different ways because I still love to take photos of people yeah, and all different kinds of people. I'm very interested that's in nice. diversity. Looks like you're on the beach and I'm shooting you from above. <laughs> An important thing for me was in the early 80s, I went with my girlfriend to Japan and we thought we might like to teach English. And we toured around Japan and enjoyed that very much and spent a weekend in Hong Kong. And then we went to Hawaii and it was in Hawaii that I really decided that I wanted to be, at least become a professional photographer at some point. And so for the second or third day in a row, there was a double rainbow over the volcanoes. And on the next balcony, there were two doves mating. And I photographed it and thought, this is what I want to do. I want to be a photographer. I want to shoot this kind of beautiful stuff all the time. But of course, I had no idea what a professional photographer actually did. Jane, do you want to come over with us? What happens with this is, is the depth of field is so short and it falls off beautifully with this lens Great. configuration. I was offered a full-time assisting job at a place called nice. ADS, Art and Design Studios, and they worked for the Bay and the Eatons and, you know, they, they did a lot of catalog stuff and shot ads that you might see on the subway or what have you. And that was a really good experience. Yes, I'm digging it. And then eventually I worked for a whole bunch of different people. I worked for Ireland Graphics, I worked for Frank Grant, and I worked for dozens of others, freelance photographers. Yeah, that's good. And like then that. as I did more of my own work, then eventually I assisted less and less. And yeah. then finally I went out on my own in the late 80s. Nice. I love shooting with the Hasselblad, but I didn't want to bite off that, no. that amount of money. So it was 16 for what's in the backpack. Yeah. An early magazine assignment, which was a lot of fun, was I photographed Celine Dion's first English language concert. She was already a big star in the Francophone world, in Quebec and France and, and in different parts of the world. But this was her jump into the rest of the world. And uh, it was a real thrill to see her live and photograph her live. And uh, since then, of course, she's polished her wardrobe and her look a great deal. But when we were photographing her after the concert, she really showed her professionalism. And she was very friendly and very focused and was really already a big star. And from doing that, it continued to excite my interest in music and personalities. And I've tried to do more and more of that when I can. 
I've worked with uh, Yusu Nador from Africa, African superstar, singer, musician. Dan Aykroyd, the uh, hilarious actor. And Hayden Christensen, who starred in several Star Wars movies. I photographed Kirk Douglas. It goes on and on, Massive Attack and the, and the music uh, arena from England, who are really, really interesting, and uh, many others. Let me shoot a few more like this. One of the easiest people to photograph was a, a terror shoot. It was 10 minutes with Tim Allen, and it was the cover of TV Guide. And he was on the Disney set doing the Santa Claus. And Tim was great. He was all systems go. But there were about seven other people from the Disney set who were standing beside me, all going, do you want your jacket, Tim? The other one going, we've only got three minutes left, all sort of interfering with the process. I knew exactly what I wanted because I had to shoot it for a cover and it had to have type here and type there. And Tim was fantastic. He gave us everything that we ever wanted in the shoot. And we got the shoot, even though I had a technical problem during the 10 minutes to the second. And we had to, to reset some of the lights and so on. But it all worked out great. Um, what made it even weirder was that I got the assignment at about midnight the day before. I got a call from the art director at about midnight, and he said, I'll be sitting on your couch at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, and we'll be off to the Disney set. And that's exactly what happened. What I like about photographing people as opposed to products is that people always have to leave eventually, and usually sooner than, you know, you know, than the art director's willing to stay. So we're shooting at Peggy's Cove for Wedding Bells magazine, and we're doing sort of a punk take on the hair and on an otherwise beautiful girl. This is our beautiful model, Ellen. And hopefully it doesn't rain today. <laughs> but when you're shooting a celebrity or a model, I mean, the model has a flight. And the shoot has to be done by 5 o'clock. I get to go home to my kids, you know. There's too many product shoots that just go on and on. And even at midnight, they go, all right, well, I can be back here at 9 o'clock in the morning and let's just pick it up. Well, I don't think we've got quite the right angle yet. And then let's just leave it set up. And, uh, you know, and I'll get approval from the client. And that might be the day after tomorrow. And it just drags on and on. And that's the whole story. Uh, I kind of like the first one too. <laughs> what I like about fashion is that uh, it's people always bouncing ideas off each other and I think when you work yeah, with a good like team you know the hairstylist comes in and goes you know well, what do you think of this and I think this looks cool. you know and sometimes people will go I, I like it a lot. you know what else you got you know right. and I think if everyone's a bit bendable you know and uh, and everyone respects each other's uh, creativity and their opinions and and I think has respect for the fact that their ideas might not be completely on point that day also, you know, and the same for me. I might come in with some lighting and go, you know, what do you think of this? And if, you know, instead everyone's like, well, oh, is it a little, you know, there's something I don't like about it, then I think, you know, I like to work with a team of people that are, that if I respect them, I'm open-minded enough to say, okay, I thought that was where we were going, but let's, you know, let's, I, I want to try and see it from your point of view, and let's try and all get on like a single vision. Tara, that looks so good. Are we going to see your feet? We're just figuring that out. Oh, okay. It looks so good as a horizontal. I mean, this is almost black and white. <laughs> uh, you know, what's interesting in the past is that it was either black and white or color. You know, there was just, it was either color film or it was black and white film. And there was no like, or you could hang color a black and white image. I mean, but your limitations, it was a big step from one thing to the other. And now with digital, you know, the, there's just so much room in there, creative room in there to explore uh, with between black and white and color. I always like to joke and say, you know, like the ultimate challenge would be like, okay, it's not color and it's not black and white. It's something else, you know? Not just desaturated color, no, something not color, not black and white, go. I mean, I like black and white. I mean, sometimes it works perfectly. I mean, 
I think sometimes it's exactly right, but even this is sort of a tone black and white. I guess for so many years, I just felt restricted that it had to be black and white or color, that now I just like all that room in between, you know? We, we shot for over 10 years for Licenza. In recent months, the uh, limited brands has taken over the, their end of it. They got bought up by an American company, and though there were all these assurances that all the Canadians were still on board, as we know, that doesn't necessarily. So, but we did, we got to shoot a lot of, uh, a lot of great uh, creative work uh, for them and, um, and, and have a lot of fun uh, with a lot of great talent. We, sh we shot it all in, uh, in New York. Yeah, I, I missed them as a client. It was a great client. I didn't lose the job. I know where it is. Just every time I go there, there's someone else doing it. I think what excites me about fashion is just being able to approach you know being able to approach it from so many different ways and i just think it's uh, in you know exhaustible you know there's just there's so many different ways of approaching i mean i i quite like this i mean i um it's not like i would want to shoot another shoot just like this though because i wouldn't because there's other ideas that i want to do you know if someone came to me and said oh i want to do exactly that and i'd be like really like we already did that let's do something else like let's do something new you know I love Caravana. Yeah. yeah. When I'm not doing assignment or shooting personalities, I, I still like to shoot for myself. And it's really important yeah, to me to do that. that. If I don't do nice. it, I get unhappy. Nice. So at different points in my career, I've pursued different series. Good. Good. As you can see here, there's religious signs. And earlier in my career, concert photography. But now I've added to that other series as well, including ice huts and ice fishing and targets and, and many other series that maybe won't come to light for a while. I think that from the beginning I was interested in the art world because I had traveled as a little kid through Europe and gone to tons of different galleries and my girlfriend and I had always gone to galleries uh, in New York and, and elsewhere and so I'd always been interested in art. but. Certainly my earlier photography, I just knew it wasn't art. It just wasn't, it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. So it's taken me a while to feel my way through it and find what I want to do. A big point for me was going to the Albright Knox Gallery and seeing a giant show on abstraction. It was called Extreme Abstraction. And I, I'm always excited to go to that gallery because they show great work. And the show had, I think, over 200 works of art. And I had been fooling around with the very graphic image of a target. And when I saw this show, I realized that there were at least six targets in the show, all of them different, and mine was different again. So it gave me permission to pursue my target series, which has been a great joy and a juxtaposition with my assignment and with my people images. Um, so now I've, I've continued with what, what we may call fine art and I've pursued different series. I've done a series of different signs like religious signs and strip joint signs and all different other things like ice fishing, ice fishing huts, uh, different vehicles, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them will see the light in years to come. When I was a kid, I was a big fisherman, and so I, I had gone on assignment for newspaper as well as shooting for myself out on the ice in the 80s and, and 90s. My targets sort of got me more interested in the ice huts and the ice fishing and the ice itself, because I find the ice really fascinating. So this particular image is one that I'm very fond of. It's a real fun thing for me to go out on the ice and talk to the guys. And one day, someone told me the most outrageous story. He said that one night, because some of the guys fish at night, because you fish for different fish at different times, um, he was out at night, and he dove down through his hole and came up in the next hole over into their ice fishing hut. I don't even know whether it's true, but they claimed that he had had a lot of vodka. Another thing that I find interesting, not on the ice and elsewhere, is vehicles. And you use snowmobiles when you're out on the ice. 
I don't have one, so sometimes I'm walking, but I especially love riding in the Bombardiers. They're huge vehicles. They were er used earlier for Arctic exploration, oil exploration, over really rough terrain. Uh, Canadian invention. They stopped making them in the 70s, and I understand that they were about $250,000 in the 70s. And so some of these vehicles that I get to go out in have literally been found somewhere in Quebec with a tree growing through them, and a the guy's worked all summer to restore this vehicle and get it going again. And they're really a thrill. They're not exactly a soft ride, but it's a, it's a cool, cool thing. I'm happy to say that I got to work with singer, songwriter, musician, Murray McLaughlin on his latest record. And uh, I photographed him for the cover against this ice hut. I used it in a more abstract way because he had really incredibly intense blue eyes and I wanted to get that enhanced in the image and so I used this behind him as an abstraction and he was very happy with it and so was I. You know, I, I never wanted to be the photographer, I guess, that can just do, well, he can shoot fashion but he can't shoot product, you know, or he can, I'm like, you know, I chose fashion because I wanted to do that rather than, you know, I had to do that. Here's a series of photographs I did um, for Flair magazine called uh, Your Majesty. We just won the gold uh, award for uh, the National Magazine Awards for, for this series. I like working on, on assignments like this where we can take a single theme, like the idea of kind of modern royalty, and then come up with a series of uh, concepts that kind of tie it all together but without you know a single direction so we can approach it from different ways and uh, and, and different techniques I mean this first shot we we took two tin ceilings and we mounted them on the wall here in the studio and then we used this uh, checkerboard floor to kind of create a, a regal palace like environment uh, this is my daughter in this photograph here Finley, she's nine years old, she's very excited to be part of the shoot, although she didn't particularly like that she was the eccentric child. She wanted to be the pretty princess, I think. Um, this is an example of, of the kind of work that my wife Lorca does. She's very good at you know, applying post-production techniques and effects uh, that really uh, kind of raise the overall feeling of the shoot. Uh, I like the graphicness of this image, I like the romance of this image, like contrasting the softness. That is my daughter again. Likewise, we approach the idea of the 1970s here. You know, a series of pictures that we sort of, uh, that we, you know, we storyboard the pictures right up front. You know, a, you know, a kind of a psychedelic repeating image, a Jerry Hall image, a David Bowie image, uh, you know, a Studio 54 image, uh, a Guy Bourdin uh, style of image. Here we went to the, four, the old Four Seasons Hotel. We built this platform to get her up high into the window there. We shot her there in the window. Um, taxi driver, we shot that right here in the hall in the studio right here. And this is just a cardboard sign in the background. Uh, we had Deborah Harry falling down drunk on stage. Uh, again, here at the, at the studio and then dancing and more psychedelia and this is a, a copy of a very famous a Chris von uh, Wagenheim photo of, uh, from a Christian Dior ad from the 1970s. Coco, um, we shot Coco a few times. Um, she's, um, she's, always a, she's always a lot of fun. She's, um, she has a very distinct modeling style which some people like and some people quite honestly don't like. She's very dramatic. She changes her poses very dramatically every single frame. If there's a downside to that, it's that there's never any room to finesse one image. It's always this expression, then that expression, and there's no time to go in and fix the hair because she's already got her hands through it and she's changing it again. Um, the upside, obviously, is there's just so much material to shoot. I mean, she just, you know, as a photographer, you want someone to perform in front of the camera. I mean, I do bristle when people tell me how to light, but if they show me examples of the kind of lighting that they like, I mean, I think that's helpful, providing I also respect that work, you know, like if they show me some great tear sheets from Vogue and from, you know, 
W Magazine or something and say, this is what we're looking for. I'm like, good, like, okay, so we all know what we're trying to do here. I don't like to tell models what to do initially. I mean, I always like to frame the start of the shoot by saying, this is what we're trying to do. You know, it's meant to be dramatic, it's meant to be serious, or it's, uh, or it's meant to be, you know, very full of life and very funny or something. And some models get that and some models don't and you sort of let it go for a while and then you can kind of see what they're going to give you and then sometimes you have to kind of correct that a bit and say, that's good, but let's try it with more of this or less of that or whatever and then you try and... Um, uh, Coco comes right off, like you just know that you're going to get a performance, you know. If anything, I think over time, you know, I find myself wanting to say, okay, just hold that a little longer because that's good, but I want to finesse it to be that much better, you know. I guess I grab little bits of time here and there to think about creative things. Sometimes it's a more formal process and I'll actually sit down and I'll take out a um, piece of paper or a sketchbook and I'll make some bad drawings but, but make notes about what I'm thinking of. Um, I don't draw very well, I guess that's why I use a camera. But in all honesty, I get ideas from, from indirect sources. I probably see more art shows that aren't photography than photography shows and I guess Part of my process with that is to have nonlinear thinking and to be thinking about a creative project in a way that, that brings something fresher to the table. Um, I think that the metal was a long-term struggle with me because um, I've, I've always enjoyed the surface of the metal and the sheen of the metal and the qualities of the metal. And so I guess about approximately 15 or 20 years ago I started working with metal. And at that point, my process was with copper and commercial bronze and aluminum, which I didn't like as much, and galvanized. But I played around with it, and, and that has evolved into the steel pieces that I've done now, which are much larger and a bit more complicated. I like fashion for fashion's sake, when it's just very clean and it's about the clothes and it's about a you know, a, a canvas or a white surface and you can really focus on the clothes and the movement of the girl. I like, you know, I like, I like shoots like that. You know, arguably, you know, this is more creative, maybe, or is that just because it's darker? Just because things are dark and somber doesn't make them necessarily, like, any more valid as art, you know? I, I don't get enough, maybe, opportunities to do that side of it, you know? Very often we're being asked to do, like, very, you know, positive images of women, you know, which I, I like doing images like that as well. I mean, in balance, we don't get to do sort of dark, foreboding images. So <laughs> I guess maybe it's nice to do, it's nice to do images like that as well. I like working with great creative hair and makeup people. I mean, advertising can very often be, you know, can be very fulfilling as well. When, you know, we fly to Istanbul and shoot for, you know, two weeks in all the locations with some of the best models in the world, working with Shalom Harlow. This is advertising, you know, this is commercial work. And yet I, I think it's as creative as a lot of what other people think is their artistic work or their editorial work, you know, like, you know, I love this image. You know, I love the old worldness of that. But, you know, this is a catalog and we're selling something. It's like catalog photography, really, you know. Um, but it can be done so well. And I think, you know, I love the challenge of doing, um, of a, you know, doing creative work for commercial clients. You know, I don't really do a lot of creative uh, work for myself. I, I find that I put all my effort into uh, commercial work and I, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of artistic decisions and, uh, you know, I, I like to think of the, the work that I do commercially, uh, both for magazines, like editorially, and, um, you know, for, for other clients. I mean, that, 
that is as personal as my work gets. Uh, you know, I put a lot of work and a lot of creative effort into those, uh, into those projects, and it really exhausts me. I mean, I very often shoot, you know, five to seven days a week. And then to have to come up with the, the concepts and, you know, design the sets in some cases, and, um, and just the logistics, the lighting, the people, the, you know, the, the locations, um, it can be very exhausting. So, you know, my spare time is spare time with my family. I, you know, I don't have a, I think if I felt like I was really not able to do some of the creative things that, uh, uh, that I want to do, then I, I would do them. But as it stands, people are always asking me for the next concept. You know, they're always saying, you know, what do you want to do? Like, what's the next idea? What's the next thing that you're excited about? And then we just translate that into uh, an editorial or into a commercial job. And that's enough for me, for the most part. Do you have like a, a beard accessory, like a nice long Yeah, I mean, when I do creative work, I like the idea that, you know, it's getting published in a magazine and maybe a half a million people or a million people are seeing it. And I think in contrast, like uh, having a, a gallery opening and having, you know, 50 or 100 of your friends come in on a Friday night and pat you on the back and tell you did a good job, I mean, it, it kind of pales by comparison. When's lunch? <laughs>